Hi guys, this is your 6.5 notes on the central limit theorem and some homework examples. So the central limit theorem, um, this is from your textbook, basically says these things. Um, we're dealing with a random variable, random variable x. It may or may not be normal. It has some mean and given standard deviation. All right, We need to know those values to do a lot of these problems. And then we're going to take simple random samples all of the same size uh, are being selected from this population that we're drawing from. Okay, now um, remember with, when we're talking about a simple random sample, that means that all the samples of that certain size have the same chance of being selected. Okay, um, the distribution of the sample means as the sample size incre increases, gets like higher and higher, it will approach a normal distribution. All right, these the possible values of the sample mean as the sample size increases will approach a bell curve. Alright, and then the mean of the sample means is always going to be the mean of the population and the standard deviation of all the sample means is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Alright, now here's the new stuff, here's the important stuff. If the original population is not normally distributed Okay, if we don't start off with a normal distribution, the common rule of thumb is if our sample size gets above 30, then the distribution of sample means will be approximately normal, right? Or we'll, we can at least uh, reasonably approximate probabilities with a normal distribution, right? So that's the key thing for you to see here. n greater than 30, the distribution of sample means is approximately normal. Okay, um, and then the other thing is, if the original population is normally distributed, if we start off with a normal distribution, then it doesn't matter what the sample size is, then we're going to get a normally distributed uh, distribution of the sample means. All right, now let me give you a visual of what this is saying. All right, so right here, this we're going to consider this a population of values. Okay, this is a population of values. And this population is obviously not bell-shaped. This is a histogram. Okay, uh, I'm, I've designed this histogram to basically have the opposite of a bell shape. It's kind of got a U-shape to it, where it peaks at the uh, low values and then it peaks again at the high values. But the values in the middle, where the mean is, the mean of 15.78, that's right here, kind of right in the dead center of this thing. The median of 14 is a little bit to the left of it. So it's not perfectly symmetric, but it's pretty close. All right, but that's the mean right there in the middle. So what I'm wanting you to see here is the population original distribution is not normally distributed. Okay, that's what this is saying right here. If we're starting off not normally distributed, right, if we get above 30, we're going to approach a normal distribution. So what I'm going to do here below it I'm going to start off with a small sample size, n equals 2. So I'm going to give you a, a visual of what's going on here. So uh, two vo very small values were picked, one around here, one around here. And they were averaged, and then that mean, that little dash right there representing the mean of those two numbers, fell. And so we've got a height right here. The 3.56 was the average of those two numbers. Okay, so that's that's our distribution of, of sample means so far. We've only had one sample mean and it fell right there. All right, now I'm going to do it again. All right, a small value was picked and a large value was picked. Their mean is right here okay, and it fell in there. Now, if I do this over and over again, I start building up a histogram. And these values, remember we're picking two at a time, the average is a number in the middle. And then as I do it over and over, the more and more I do it, I start getting all these different sample means uh, and, and where they fall on the number line. All right, This is going from 0 to 32, so is this. Now, just to speed it up so you don't see every single sample, this gives us the ability to, to speed it up and do more than one at a time. So I'm going to do five samples and just notice how the shape of this thing behaves. So I just keep going over and over and over again. And if you notice, the distribution is not bell curved. Okay, 
it's got a little bump and then down and it goes up again and then down and it goes up again. If I keep doing that over and over and over again, it it's not quite normal. Okay, we've got a very small sample size. All right, we're not anywhere close to that magic number of 30 yet. So we're not seeing a normal distribution at all. Now I'm going to really speed it up. All right, and then jump to 10,000. And again, we're seeing something very strange looking. It's it's like this. Uh, it's wanting to peak here in the middle, and because it's symmetric, we're getting a lot of values at the uh, big values and a lot of small values in the population. When we average, because uh, there's a good chance of some small values and there's also a good chance of big values, we're um, they're kind of balancing each other out and we're getting a lot of sample means right here in the middle but we're also getting a lot on the ends and so we're not we don't see anything that looks like a, a normal curve yet so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the sample size I'm going to go ahead and jump up to 10 and then we're picking 10 values at random and if I average all 10 of those numbers I get this number okay and again if I do it again if I add up all 10 of those numbers and divide by 10 I get that number all right, and as I keep doing this over and over again, and again we're seeing the distribution of sample means now of size 10, and again I'm going to fast forward and start doing five at a time. And now those values on the ends are just not happening as often. And why is that? Because we're doing 10 at a time. And so we're getting some from up here, some from down here, and even though they're not all that quite frequent, we're still getting a few here and there towards the middle but again the most frequent things happening are on the far right end or the far left end but because they're balancing each other out when we're averaging we're getting a lot more values in the middle so again speeding up the process going up to a thousand we're starting to see something that looks like a bell curve okay and then just cut to the chase if I jump up to 25 I'll end up one animated sample of this. But you get the idea. We're taking 25 values from the data set at random, getting uh, the average of those 25 values. And as I do this over and over again, I'm really getting close to 30 now. All right, we're really starting to see a bell curve come up with the possible sample means. Now, again, if I jump, that was 20, if I jump to 25. Um, notice if I did 10 versus 25, let me grab a copy of this. Alright, so I, I just copied and, and pasted these so you can kind of see what I'm trying to get at. This is the original population's values. Okay, this was the sample size of size 10. This is the samples of size 25. And what I want you to see here is the as um, the sample size increases not only does it become more and more bell shaped okay they're both pretty much bell shaped but that bell shape tightens the bell curve tightens as the sample size gets larger and larger and larger all right we get a bell curve that tightens around and if you think about it it makes sense why I would do that because remember here's the mean so as as we increase the sample size larger and larger and larger towards the population size, whatever the population size is here, um, there's less chance that we get really big sample means or really small sample means because we're getting more and more and more of the population. So eventually if this n grows large enough it will be the population size and and then there's only one possible value for the mean every time that that population mean. And this thing would just be infinitely skinny and just have one bar right there where the population mean is. Okay, so that's the other thing I want you to see. As n increases, that bell curve not only becomes more of a bell shape, it also gets skinnier. There's less spread in the data. Now, if you think about the formula th that we get for the standard deviation of the sample means, that makes sense because as n gets bigger, the denominator gets bigger, Right, there's only one value that this can be. It never changes for the population standard deviation. So we're dividing the same number by bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger values. And if you think about how fractions work, um, one half versus one third, one fifth, 
1 tenth 1 over 100, what happens to these values? You know, as the denominator gets larger and the numerator stays the same, all right, it, this has to stay the same because there's only one population um, standard deviation. The fraction's getting smaller, and it, actually it's approaching zero. And remember, this measures spread in the data. So that spread in the data is getting smaller and smaller and smaller to where eventually, if we kept increasing the sample size, there'd be no spread in the data. It all would just be the mean, the value in the middle. All right, um, let's jump in and do an example of this stuff. So the important stuff here uh, is jumped all the way down here. It's talking about um, other stuff that happened in the book earlier. But the, the important part here is we have, um, oops, um, weights of males are normally distributed with a mean of 72 pounds and a standard deviation of 29 pounds. All right, that's the important thing for you to see here. All right, and then the questions ask, find the probability that if an individual man is randomly selected, find the probability his weight will be greater than 175 pounds. Well, this is just a plain old normal CDF problem. If, if this is just a plain individual from the data set, this is just normal CDF, lower number, upper number. So we would do 175 as the lower number. Upper number is just some big 99999. And then the mean and standard deviation, 172, 29. All right. And if we do that on our calculator, all right, we get 0.4588 or 0.459 to three places. And this is just like a problem we saw in, in the last chapter, our last section. It's just a normal distribution, and we're picking a, an individual person from that distribution. So no need to adjust the standard deviation because it's not sample means. We're not looking at uh, the distribution of sample means. We're just looking at a value from the data set. But part B, find the probability that 20 randomly selected men will have a mean weight that's greater than 175 pounds. Now we do have to adjust the standard deviation because we're not dealing with men from the data set. We're dealing with a sample from the data set and a, in particular a mean of that sample will fall above 175. So now we take that 29 and we divide by the square root of 20. Okay. Standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size if you're dealing with the distribution of means and that's what we're dealing with here. All right, so I'm going to do the exact same thing. The second enter will take me back to the last thing I just did. And then divide by the square root of the sample size for that last value. Okay, now you folks that have the newer TI-84s, it'll give you a menu and it'll ask lower number, upper number. So you just type in 175, 999. And then it'll ask what's the mean and standard deviation. You give it 172 as your mean. And then this is your standard deviation for sample means. Okay? So because it's sample means, we have to divide by that square root of 20. And then I hit enter and now I get 0.3218, right? Which is 0.322 to three places. All right, so look at the difference between the problems. Find the probability a single man, somebody from this data set, right? This is weights of men. So a single person from this data set is being selected. Or 20 people at random from this data set are being selected. And then we're averaging the uh, weights of those 20 men. All right, that's when we divide versus when we don't. All right, same idea. Women's heights are normally distributed with a mean given by 61.4 and a standard deviation given by 37.7. If one woman is randomly selected, one person from this data set, find the probability her height's less than 62. So for part A, that's just another plain old 6.3 normal CDF problem. All right, it's not dealing with means, so that's just normal CDF. It says less 
than 62, so we're going to use a negative 999 here. All right, the mean is 61.4. Standard deviation is 3.7. All right, no need to divide that 3.7 by anything because it's just one person from the data set. All right, so 0.564 to three decimal places. All right, and then part B says if 50 women are randomly selected, find the probability they have a mean less than 62. So again, the difference between the two is the second one is dealing with the distribution of sample means for samples of size 50. So we take the square root of 50 and divide that standard deviation by that. So we get 0.874 to three decimal places. All right, so again, remember, if you're dealing with a sample mean, 50 women are randomly selected, find the probability they have a mean. That's when we divide by the standard deviation. But this doesn't mention anything about a mean. This is just dealing with one person at random from the data set. Okay, again, that's that switch you're going to have to flip to be able to know when you divide the standard deviation when you don't. All right, suppose uh, certain coins have weights that are normally distributed, mean of this, standard deviation of this. The vending machine is configured to accept coins as long as it falls in this weight range. So if you've ever put a coin in a coin machine, and it just absolutely will not take that coin. This is kind of what what it's talking about. It's either too light or too heavy, and it, the machine's rejecting it. So what they're wanting us to do is answer this first question: 250 coins are inserted into the vending machine. What's the expected number of rejected quarters? Remember, expectation. This is binomial, right? It's either rejected or it's not. Each one's independent. So this is. Uh, the expected value of the number of quarters that are going to get rejected. So remember, expect, expected value in the binomial distribution is n times p, where this is how many quarters we're going to put in there, and this is the probability any quarter is rejected. Well, it's normally distributed, so we're going to use the normal distribution to come up with these probabilities of rejection. So it's rejected if it weighs below this or above this. So the easy way to find that is 1 minus the normal CDF of what's between these two. So 5.820 comma 6.060 and then the mean was 5.94 and the standard deviation is 0 0.075. All right, so 0 0.1096 roughly. All right, so that's P. So N times P is what we just got right here times 250. So 27.4, now obviously this is discrete, so we would say about 27. All right, and then if 250 different coins are inserted into the vending machine, what's the probability that the mean, again, probability that the mean of these 250 falls in between those limits? All right, so now that becomes normal CDF, lower number, upper number, so 5.82 comma 6.06, all right, comma the mean, the mean of the uh, sample means is the same as the mean of the population, so 5.94, but then the standard deviation gets divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, you're going to get a, a probability of 1, 
and if you think about it, it we should. Right, because really it's going to be like point nine 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 nine, you know, for a long way, which is virtually one. And if you think about it again, what we we're talking about up here is as these sample sizes increase, these this distribution becomes bell shaped, and then it gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. All right, this. Uh, data set that we're originally talking about. These two values, here's the mean, here's the two values, they're already a couple of these standard deviations away above and below, or, or pretty close to two already. And remember 95% of the data falls in between two standard deviations uh, in, in the original population. But we're taking this number and dividing by the square root of 250. We're taking this uh, value down way far. So these two numbers are going to be several standard deviations away from this mean when we are taking this distance uh, that we're measuring as the standard deviation and dividing by the square root of 250. Alright, just so you can see it. 0 0.075 divided by the square root of 250 is 0 0.0047 okay so take 5.94 the mean and subtract this lower number 5.82 and then divide by this number up here point zero zero four seven we're talking like 25 standard deviations away from the mean. Okay, you know everything's going to fall within that. I mean, if 95, 99.7 falls between three, we're talking about 25 standard deviations from the mean. Everything's going to fall in there. Everything's going to. All right, another question. Um, Engineer is going to redesign an injection sheet for an airplane. The seat was designed for pilots weighing between these two weights years ago originally. But a new population of pilots has a normally distributed weights with this is the mean. And this is the standard deviation. So we're s selecting a pilot, right? just one pilot. Find the probability his weight falls in between there. All right, so since it's a pilot we don't have to worry about adjusting the standard deviation so that's just normal CDF lower number is 1 50 upper number is 201 alright and the mean and standard deviation so 156 is our new mean and our standard deviation is 34 and a half So 0.473 roughly. All right, if 32 different pilots are randomly selected, find the probability that their mean falls in between there. So now we do need to divide by the standard deviation. Second enter brings back the last thing I just did. Divided by the square root of the sample of size 32. 0.83 roughly. All right, and then part C says when re redesigning the ejection sheet, which probability is more relevant? Well, more than likely this one, but the reality is it depends. It depends on is it are we redesigning it for a single person? Is it is there going to be a pilot who flies this plane that we're redesigning this seat for? and that one pilot is going to be the only one that, f that flies it or is it going to be for you know several uh, a group of people m multiple people will fly this plane or are we going to re redesign a seat to be used in general for s several airplanes to where we're going to need different 
then you know, have fluctuation in weights. In that case, this will be more important. So unless we're redesigning a seat on an, an airplane for a pilot, that's when we would use this, then most likely this is going to be the more important one, the more relevant one. So I'm going to write probably B. But it depends. All right, but more than likely be more than likely if we make something we're going to have more than one person in mind all right so that's um, your uh, your notes and some of your examples from 6.5 if you have any questions on this just send me an email click on that ask my instructor button on your homework